Welcome to the second video on stress differential equations. So last time we already saw I mean, the main result of this chapter, which was theorem 5.3. So this was about the existence and uniqueness of solutions to stress differential equations. So let me briefly recall the assumptions because in this video, we want to prove in particular the existence result. So what we assume is we assume that the coefficients, so this here is our equation we, so we mean by a stress differential equation. So this is what we want to solve in the sense that we want to show that there exists an adapted integral stress process fulfilling this integral equation. So this is our SDE and to be consistent with lecture, what number is it? Um, uh, uh, 5.4. So this is the goal. And we assume that this the coefficient here mu is Lipschitz continuous as well as the coefficient sigma. And both satisfy a linear growth condition, meaning, I mean, if you send x to infinity, they, they grow at most linearly fast. Okay. And so, what we want to do to so show today is that there exists indeed an adapted drastic process solving this drastic differential equation. And this um, solution will satisfy this bound in L2, so where it's uniformly bounded in L2. And last time, you already check that if there is a, a solution, um, it is pathwise unique. So if there are two, assumingly two solutions, they are indistinguishable processes. Already last video. All right, um, so in order to solve this, or find a solution to this drastic differential equation, uh, we want to follow the classical approach um, of a Picard iteration. And this is as you would solve ordinary differential equation, which I included, if you set sigma to be zero, then we have just the ordinary differential equation. Um, For the existence proof, we consider um, the following map. So we consider the map F, which maps from H2 to H2, okay. um, such that, okay, I take a process X and I map it to the right-hand side of this equation. So this is what I call fx, which is just, again, a stress process. And now this is the right-hand side of the equation, as I promised you. So x0 plus the, the Bexilchis integral here plus the e2 integral. Yes. Map. All right. So this is the map we want to consider, and then we want to show that the, that a fixed point exists. Right. So if a, a fixed point to this um, mapping F is a solution to the stress differential equation, just by definition of the um, map F. Um, right, so. Fixed point of F is a solution to. All right. And we know already that, okay, in this case, since we already chose the, the third property, we know that the solution is unique. So there's actually a unique fixed point. Uh, all right. And then we want to use an Picard iteration to show the. Um, 
um, to use the equation. So we define iteratively. Um, so x um, in the n plus one step is just given by f applied to the nth step and x zero is just given by the as a initial condition. Right? So we, we in the first step, in the zero step, we plug in the initial condition, or this is a constant function to be equal to x zero, right? This here is a constant. Here we go. Um, all right. Um, so what we want to show that, that this sequence xn converges to a process x, and then we want to show that this process x is a limit uh, to uh, is then a solution to the differential equation, a stochastic differential equation. Um, but before we can do this, we need to check that this mapping f is well defined. This is basically the context of the content of the next lemma, which is lemma uh, 5.6 in the lecture notes. Right. Um, so we always work under the assumption of the, the existent and uniqueness results. So we assume that all the assumption of theorem 5.3, I mean, hold true, right? So all the, the assumption I gave you here that we have a measurable function sigma and mu, which are Lipschitz continuous and fulfill this linear growth condition. So this is our setting for today, all right? Um, so first thing what we do want to do is, so if we have an X in H2, right, then um, we also know that the coefficients now, if I plug N X, X into sigma, they are H2 and if I plug x into mu, it's in L2. Right. Right. So why do you want to show it? Well, if I take such an x in H2, plug it into my f, so both integrals are well-defined. So this is a well-defined map. Okay. The second thing I want to check is if I take an x in H2, um when it's pretty long. um right so if it's unibounded formally bounded in l2 then the same holds true for f of x when uh okay Um, yeah, it's true. So if I have an X, which is uniformly bounded in L2, then also the F of X is uniformly bounded in L2. That's all. Okay. So this in particular, why do I want to have this? Well, because I want to prove II, so the second property along the way. Okay. So if there's a fixed point, um, it's fine, right? Because we start here, for x0, this is certainly true. And if I iterate it, it's also for all the following elements in the sequence true. All right, let's come to the proof. Um, so we start the first property. Um, so what do we want to check is we want to check, if I look at here the sigma, Oh, um, so if I plug pl x into sigma, then it's an L2, an H2. So I want to check that this expected value here is finite. So let me take the linear growth of um, 
sigma. So I get here a constant in front of it and then the integral from zero to t of one plus x if it's squared. Yes. Right. right. But this is okay and this we can calculate, right? So we can integrate out the, the one. So we get here a c times t plus c times and then I have the actually the L2 norm uh, of g squared because here one half is there. So I have the squared of the L2 norm on the product space omega t. All right, so that's simple because by assumption, that's finite. Okay, so the first property is simple and this here works on, um, this in the same manner, right? Analogously. All right. Okay, so we, we come to the next point where we need to check the uniformly bound. Um, and so we will we want to check this here. All right. So let's come to the second property. Um, Um, so what we want, we want to estimate f of x t to the power two. Okay. Um, okay, let's write down the definition of f. And this is just x zero plus the integral over mu, mu with respect to ds plus the integral from zero to t of sigma x b. Here we go. All right. Um, cool. And now let's let's estimate. Okay, we have the square. Okay, so we can get the square to each um, solvent, uh, and then we have three sums, so we get a factor of three here. Um, so we get three times the expected value of x zero, which is just a constant, so that's boring. Um, get three times the expected value of the Bexilkis integral here. Plus three times the e to n equal squared. Okay. Okay. Um. Now, okay. We we want to keep estimating this. So first, of course, this is just a constant. So let's treat it like constant. Um, all right, uh, okay, here we can use Jensen. So to pull in the um, square into the integral, right? And then we get, if you use Jensen, we get the T factor here. And this is, mm, I write it, and here we use um, Ito's isometry to get the square inside. So wait, if you use Ito's isometry, this integral with respect to the Brownian motion gets uh, an integral with respect to the radiation, radiation, which is this, right? So that's, let me write it down here. So Jensen plus Ito. Symmetry. Cool. Um, so what's the next estimate? Mm. So we can use the linear growth condition of mu and um, of mu and sigma, right? So we get again. Okay, we have here the constant initial uh, value um, condition zero plus 
And then we have three times C T plus one, right? This is it's three times C, you come from both and here for T and here for one. And then you have the integral of zero T of one plus X squared um, DS. All right. Okay, cool. Um, and now, okay, we can integrate this out. Ah, okay, let us use, first use Fubini. All right, so what we do is we pull in the expected value. <coughs> Everything is positive, so that's fine. Uh, you get here you one plus then the expected value of x squared. Yes. All right. Um, cool. And now we know, uh, okay. Uh, okay. So what we know is there exists a constant, let's call it B, such that we can estimate the supremum of all T of X, if they are the L2 norm of X by the constant B, right? L2 norm means the square, right? Why do you can do with this? Uh, this was just part of the assumption here. All right. Okay, so we can do this. Um, so this means we use this estimate, so we can estimate this simply by three times x zero t plus three times c t. Okay, we can estimate t by a capital T, and then we get here our one plus. So this is the one, and here we get our b term dt. And this holds actually for all t and t, right? So in particular, since the right-hand side does not depend on little t, this holds uniformly for all t and capital T. So we show the, the claim. All right, cool. That's, so our map is well-defined and ensures that if we plug in a uniform uh, in a uniformly bounded and rival of uh, this process in L2, then it's also the F of the, the following element in the sequence also bounded, uniformly bounded in L2. All right. Um, okay, so the map is well defined, and now I would like to prove an a priori estimate if I look at our sequence. So this is content of MR. 3.7 as before let's assume that the assumptions of um, our theorem so the existence and uniqueness theorem hold true so we have suppose that we have this the, the linear growth condition of sigma and mu and the Lipschitz condition the condition and then we know and there exists a constant D, right? Okay, I'm just running through the alphabet. And what do we know is, okay, actually, if we look at the supremum norm in expectation, right? Um, and of the difference of the x plus one, uh, n plus one elements, now sequence x minus the n element to the power square, then we can actually estimate it by this constant d multiplied with the integral from zero to t of the expected value of xn minus x and minus one. So of the difference of the previous elements, right? So you see, I mean, here's an n plus one, here's an n minus one. So we shifted uh, one time 
I want element in the sequence before dt. Well, t and all n. Why do we care about our read? Okay, why, why do we want to have such an estimate? Well, we want to show that this sequence of xn is a Cauchy sequence, right? And so, so we want to estimate the distance um, of two elements um, of the sequence. I want to make it sure if uh, ensure or prove that if n goes um, to infinity, that this difference goes to zero, quick enough. All right. Mm, so this is our last lemmas preparation before coming to the X-Lex system. All right. So let's prove this. Um, Mm. So let's, okay, I want to look at the difference. So, okay, look at, let's look at X N at the time S and same for R. Let's take here plus one and here N, right? This is this difference here. And I want to, well, what is it? I mean, okay, the, the initial values, they, they disappear. So I have the integral from zero to T of the difference of mu if I put in the n's element, right? Minus, um, do I get the n minus one element? Plus zero to t, and here I get the difference of sigma r and the nth element and minus sigma. Then uh, dt, okay, that's here, sorry, D, dbr, right? Okay, so this is just plugging in the definition how we define this sequence um, xn. Okay, so if we look now at well, what we want to estimate, so if we look at the expected value of the supremum from zero to t, of the difference here of x n plus one minus x n yes squared. So how can we estimate this? Okay, we, we use what we just have learned. Okay, here we go. And the same estimate as before. So if we, we want to have the, the square on each summit here, so what we do is we get twice um, the expected value of the supremum, right? We have here a supremum t, and then what well, we get the first integral here. R squared, and well, we have still the Schrödinger integral. So we get twice, and then the supremum from S to T of the Schrödinger integral squared. So here, sigma R. And R. Yeah. 
um, dBs squared. Okay, that's okay. a rather elementary estimate. Um, and now mm, we, we we need to have okay for realistic estimate. So first, for the first term, okay, we use Jensen. Okay, let's okay. Let's estimate the first one. So twice ah, I use Jensen. I wait to get T here or an S. Okay, so let me. So the T was correct, but let me follow the lecture notes. And uh, why do you, you you make Jensen here so you integrate up to? Oh, this is an S. Sorry, take the supremum S. Um, up to t. Um, so you get an s here, then the integral from 0 to s. And now you get here the integrand squared. Integrand squared, as I promised you. All right. And what you can we use here? Well, here we use dupes inequality. Right? Because then we want to get rid of the supremum, so we can use dupe. Um, well, the trick is to use dupe. So we get an eight, and this is dupes inequality. It's there. Okay, I get okay. I get four times, um, and four times two is eight. So I get eight times the. Um, expected value of the integral from zero to t now, right? I can estimate the running supremum with the, the martingale at the terminal time. That's great. So I get here t and, okay, what? Okay, so uh, t and now I need to just copy what I have there. Um, so I get z more times r. Uh, here I forgot some of minus one, sorry, minus one, minus one, R. And then the Brownian motion and the whole integral squared. Okay. Right. So we have only a couple of uh, inequalities which you just iteratively use through all the proof. proof. No, it's not, I mean, we have not so many inequalities available. Um, okay. So let's estimate the, the first sum a bit further. Okay, we can estimate this little s here with a t. So we get twice t. And then, well, the integral is maximized if we integrate. I mean, this is non negative integrand. So if you integrate up to the most, the biggest time, so this is little t, we get the maximum. So we know the supremum is actually attended by. The integral from zero to t of this difference here. All right. D, well, where's the s coming from? This is not an s. This is not an s. But I guess I. Sorry. Uh, here we go. This is. R and I forgot some of the square, square dt. All right, and okay, let's come to the second integral. Um, so, okay, obviously, um, we want to use Ito's isometry. Ah, Ito's isometry. Uh, so, I have eight times the expected value. This allows me to put in the two here. So, I have an integral from zero to t. Of sigma t r t r t r. All right, yeah, I get the square. All right, mm. and now I use my Lipschitz estimates, uh, the Lipschitz condition of um, sigma and we. Mu, I mean, sigma, mu, uh, Lipschitz. Cool. 
So what do I get? I get, um, okay, I estimate the little t with the capital T, so C times C is the Lipschitz constant from sigma and um, mu. And I have twice um, dt, and here I have an eight, so plus eight. And then I have the expected value of my, using my Lipschitz estimate of zero to t of the difference of x n minus x n minus one r bar square. All right, and okay, let's, let's call this d and we are done. Here we go. All right, this is what we wanted to show is let's let's scroll up to check if we did the right thing. Actually, we did. So we estimated here the expected value of the supremum with the constant times the integral over the difference here. And this is exactly what we have done here. Right, this is the left hand side of our claim, and this is now the right hand side. Cool. Um, all right. So now we, we have all ingredients um, together to prove our mean result. It's still a bit of work, but we just need to uh, put everything together. All right, proof of theorem 5.3. Here we go. Um, okay. Existence. All right. Um, okay, the, okay, we, okay. The uniform bound, I mean, if you have existence, it's trivial. So we don't care about this one. Uh, so we care only about the existence. Let's start with the first step. Um, the first step is the almost sure convergence. of our sequence xn, right? So this was the Pika iterate, uh, iteration we defined. Um, and we want to ensure that this converges to a uniform, to a continuous limit. Right. All right, then we do the L2 conversion and then we need to verify that x, so the limit, is indeed a solution to the Schwarzschild differential equation. All right, let's do step one. Um, so we define, so we have a bit of short notation, the function g as just our supremum uh, from zero, uh, from n zero to t of the difference we just estimated, right? This is, uh, it's not a conceptual definition, it's uh, to make our uh, notation shorter. Um, so this is defined for zero t and zero to capital T, and of course, all natural numbers. Cool. Okay, so now, now do as I said, I mean, we, we want to use um, what we have. Um, so first observation is, let's use our last lemma, which was lemma 5.7, which tells us um, that gn at time t can be estimated by this constant d times the integral from zero to t of g and minus one integrated over s, right? And this is just, I mean, using, I mean, rewriting lemma 5.3 with the definition of G. Cool. And now we can mm, and lemma, okay. 5.6 tells us, but this was the one before, that if I look here 
at the supremum from zero to T over G zero, that's one. Hmm. And what this is something, okay, this is just material. And this mean we have, if we look at G one, well, we can estimate this by D times geo yes and this can be estimated by m d right this is oh, zero can be estimated by uh, and t okay and we can keep doing so so if you look at g2 right we get here g1 Yes, yes. Well, if you iterate this, what do you get? We get m times d squared t. t. Mm -hmm. And now we can use an induction argument. So such y induction gn at time t is less or equal than m times g dt's oh, it's not squared it's the power n divided by n factorial that's great because this goes to zero um okay so let's well, what do we get from this i mean we have four can use markov's inequality uh, Inequality. Um, to estimate the probability that the supremum from zero to little t of the difference of x n plus one minus x n Can be estimated by well this gives this factor to this year gives us a factor two to the power two n of the supreme uh, of the expected value of the supremum from zero to t x n plus one minus x n yes yes. Um, mm, right, so then this gives us, you know, we use this estimate here. So we have n times n factorial. And okay, this two to the power n, I mean, comes in here. So let's take four dtn squared, right? So we pull in this. All right. Um, okay. All right. So now we want to use uh, where I can tell the argument to get to, to show that this converges almost surely in the supreme norm. Okay. Uh, good. So let's define the, the set A. N, which is the, the set in omega such that the supremum here is bigger than two to the power minus N. If we do so, well, what you have is if you look at the sum from well, n to infinity well, of the probability of a uh, n, well, we can use our estimate here of this gives us m, and we can estimate it by the expected. Uh, uh, Right, so we have just the sum here, and the sums converge to the 
expected uh, exponential function, sorry, um, or four times d, ds, uh, dt. And, and this is certainly finite. Okay, and then Borel Cantelli. Borel Cantelli, very useful lemma. Um, tells us that if I look at the event, which is the lim at supremum as n goes to infinity of a n, right? And you often write it like this. If I take the intersection of all n and then of the unit of all m bigger than n of a m, Event. So let me write again. A satisfies that the probability of A is equal to zero. Okay. So this means that, well, if I look at the complement, this has a event one. And the complement of A, and we can write it down. So this is the supremum of all the union of all, uh, sorry, the, 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 the union of all N, such that if I look at the intersection of all M, we got the N of the complements of A, right? Okay, this is just writing. And this means for P almost every omega, there exists a, a n depending on omega and n such that the supremum over t, if I look at the difference here of the m and m is this holds actually for all m being bigger than n. And if I look at this difference here, uh, which at the point omega, then this is less or equal than two to the power. Yeah. This is how we defined it, right? So the this event that it's bigger than two to the power minus n is a zero event if I make m large enough. Um, so we have this. Okay, so this means for almost every omega in omega, the sequence here is a Cauchy sequence. Cauchy sequence uniformly in T. Yeah. Why? Okay. So if I look at the And this is, I mean, the standard argument. I mean, this works. I mean, this is the same idea as for every um, fast converging sequence. Um, so, right, if you look now at the difference of, well, let's say, k and l, And so this is an argument which is independent of the, the explicit structure it's just because we have here the such fast convergence. So this can be estimated by the triangle inequality where the sum from L to K minus one of the supremum so to T and then Right here, then are the, the one step differences of m and m plus one omega 
This can be estimated by what we have done before by the sum over all M, which are bigger than L. And then we have, right, we can calculate this can be estimated by is equal to two to the power L minus uh, two to the power minus L plus one. And this holds for all K and L being bigger than N depending on omega. All right. Um, so we have a Cauchy sequence in the, on the space of continuous function. So what we can do now is just to uh, um, and denote by x mm, the Continuous um, limit of x and omega um, on the set AC, and otherwise uh, we set a uh, right, the other the the the, the complement of the set A is the null set anyway, so we can just set it to zero. All omega and a. Okay, good, good. So we have a limit which is continuous. Mm. Okay. Um, step two. Step two. Um, the step two is okay. We also want to have the L two conversions. Plus the two boundedness of the limit. Okay. Mm, cool. How do we get it? Well, we want to apply step one, one and for two. I mean, this is not so hard. Um, so what do we get? So let's estimate the um, expected value of the supremum from zero to T of T dt. Right, and this is the L2 norm. If you want to estimate, um, and well, this is when we have the point-wise convergence, so we can write this as limit from m to infinity of the supremum zero to t of x m t. And this is step one. Now we use for two you know, to pull out the limit. So then we get here limit inferior of m to infinity of the expected value of the supremum from zero to t of x. Oh, that's an m. Xn t. Here we have our xn t. Right. Um, what we you know how to estimate this? Well, we we use the same trick as before. So we make our telescoping sum argument and then tree angles inequality, which tells us we can estimate this by the sum from m to uh, from n sorry, n to m minus one the expected value of the supremum from zero to t of the difference of m, uh, no worries, it's running over k, so of k plus one minus k. Hmm. 
and I know how to estimate this one, right? So this is simple. I can estimate it by the sum from n to infinity of the expected value of Okay, let me directly estimate here this. So I can estimate this before by m times dtk divided by k factorial. Then I feel one half. Oh, I forgot some one half. Uh, one half. All right, and this goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Cool. All right, so this gives us the L2 convergence. Oh. I'm running out of space. Um, so this is shows the L2 conversions and using our previous estimates so lemma. 5.6, we also have that, uh, look at the supremum over t0 to t of x ds t against, or we can estimate this y twice, oh. Uh, now we need to approximate x, so we sneak in here an approximation step, for example, n twice plus twice the L2 norm of n, but this is bounded by 5.6. So we get here a uniform estimate. All right, cool. So this is fine. All right. So last thing we have to do is to verify um that x is a solution uh solves solves the s d e right. okay All right let's do that um okay we we need to Uh, there's two things. Uh, oh, um, first thing, okay, let's go look at the interesting integral. So if you look at the integral from zero to t, oh, okay, let's plug in the limit x. Then I want to approximate it with xn square yes okay. Uh, okay so i mean this basically tells me then my eta's isometry that the stressic integrals which are the left hand uh, right hand side or equation converge as well so i so here let's use the lipschitz estimate so to t x dx Yes. Okay. Uh, so this is sigma is Lipschitz. Okay. Cool. Um, well, this can be estimated, right? So we can estimate it by CT, and then the supremum over the T of x T TN squared and this goes to zero as n goes to infinity by step two cool uh, so okay this is so true and well by the same calculation we also know okay and we use again the Lipschitz estimate and that if I look at the deterministic integral here and uh, the Lebesgue still here that you go, um, this goes to zero as well. As n goes to infinity. Cool. 
So what does it mean? So in particular, the coefficients, if I plug in a well-defined, so this is in H2, and this here is in L2. Yeah. And we have the conversion as we wanted. So these the stress integrals here, so the E2 integrals, they go to the limiting object. And the Riemann integrals, or oh, the Bexilius. Uh, right. Yes, go to the limit. Both as n goes to infinity. All right. And so let me give you the overall picture. If I look at the Picard iteration, right, this was f of xn. This is x0 plus mu s dxn ts plus e2 integral. Oh, this is sigma. Sigma ts ts. Right, I know that this goes to x. And okay, this here, of course, goes to x zero. This here goes to the limit. And this goes to the integral of the limit. Oh, it's a running motion. Here we go, um, right? And this holds for any T or any T, oh, not all, any, oh, any T and T that we can extend it for all T by the usual argument that we can show it for a countable set and by continuity, we can extend it for uh, all. T and T uniformly, uh, almost surely. Okay. X is a solution of the SDE. Clear, you got it. All right. Thank you for watching the video. Bye.